Hi, my name is Jason Bunn Parsons. I'm an autistic self advocate, and uh, and um, and I started a meeting to discuss the material in a book that I wrote um, called "Putting the Autism Puzzle Pieces Together." And you can find that book on at aacphoenix.com, and then you find the tab that says "Putting the Autism Puzzle Pieces Together," and you'll find PDF copy downloads. But nevertheless, um, my friend Philip here um, is the only one that that's, um, showed up today, and he's already heard um, me share this material before. Um, I started going to an East Valley autism group, um, autistic support group, run by Sue Galbach, who is a now retired occupational therapist, and Tara Marshall, who's a speech language pathology assistant, both of whom are autistic, and therefore both of them understand autism from both a personal and professional point of view, which gives a really good understanding, uh, a, a really balanced understanding about what autism is. It's not just simply, you know, here's all of our problems, but, but really, you know, understanding, you know, autism, not just from the perspective of the non-autistic, which is what all the textbooks are written from, but from both viewpoints. And so, um, Philip, um, when did you start going to Sue and Tara's group? Um, I started going to Sue and Tara's group at about, uh, in 2000, yeah, in the fall of 2003 when I was 22 years old in October. Oh, so that was um, right about the time that Sue and Tara took over the group because I understand that um, about, because somebody else originally started the group way back when. Yes, it was a guy named Daniel. He had Asperger as well. He's the one who started the group. Mm -hmm. And and so so he was still leading the group at the time that you started. Yes, at the time uh, Daniel was starting the group along with uh, Tara as I believe second in command. Mm -hmm. And we were meeting at uh, ASU at the Newman Center. Oh, at okay. The University and College Avenue. Okay, and um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned when exactly I started. I I started in September of 2009. Uh, um, I was first identified as an autistic by my mom, who's a now retired LPN after she went to an in service. That, and I'm pretty sure that the people that um, that did the in service was Sark. Um, um, Southwest Autism Research and Resource Organization is the number one autism organization locally here in Phoenix, Arizona, USA. But anyways, you know, so you know, so you know, they're presenting all this information about autism and Asperger's, and my mom's like, "This is my son," you know. And so, um, anyways, so you know, she presented the information to me, which I initially rejected because I was sick and tired of all the labels. But um, but what really, you know. You know, turned my head was specifically the bowel control issues that that a that a nephew of mine or or second cousin second cousin nephew something like that I think it was second cousin anyways bottom line you know, is he was like five years old and he was still having bowel control issues and and this was you no know, linked to, to his autism and this is something that I myself had struggled with and nobody could explain you know, why, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, why I could not control my bowels. And so, um, so in September is when I started going to the group and, um, you know, to, to learn about, you know, autism. I got formally diagnosed actually in the summer of 2009 when I applied for SSI and, and, um, and I actually succeeded in getting it, which is a shock to, to, Almost all my autistic friends, because they can't figure out how to, to um, you know, to get the benefits. But I, anyways. But bottom line is, I've been on SSI ever since, and um, and it's only recently that I've I finally acquired enough knowledge about autism to where I figured out a vocation that I can actually do. Which um, I'm going to school now at Carrington College to be a physical therapy tech, and. Um, and I just completed my, my first module, and um, and and um, and it it was definitely very challenging. I I wasn't expecting it to be nearly as hard, and um, and you know I had a game plan about about how things were going to be better this time than in high school. Now, I 
Uh, he was scored as having 140 IQ in third grade, um, but um, I graduated from high school with a 1.9 GPA by the skin of my teeth, and so that gives you an idea of, um, of, of just how much I struggled. And so you know, I had this, you know, this you know, well laid out strategy about how things were gonna be a lot easier, and you know, some of it's works you know, fairly good, Others, you know, it's still a work in progress, okay? Um, you know, how do you learn? How do I learn? How have I learned about autism? Well, part of it is having, you know, people like Sue Tara and later Dr. Uh, Brian Woodruff, who's a neurologist um, who, um, who's become interested in our group for personal reasons. And so, um, and, and, you know, in the time that they've spent, you know, one-on-one -on -one dialogue, you know, um, you know, a lot like the old-fashioned apprenticeships, where, where you know, um, you know, back, you know, in the Middle Ages, before you know that they had the compulsory education, you know, um, you know, you would have, you know, a lot like a carpenter. Okay, yeah, you no, know, he's a master carpenter. Okay, and so somebody else wants to learn the carpentry trade, and so they would become that that. That's um, that master carpenter's apprentice, and after you know the the, um, the apprentice learns you know all you know all this stuff, he then journeys to another town that doesn't have a carpenter. Thus, the term journeyman. Okay, that's where the term journeyman comes from. Is is the apprentice after completing his training under the the master teacher, then journeys to another town that doesn't have a carpenter or a doctor or whatever in order, you know, to then offer his services in that town. So anyways, um, and so that's how I, I learned best, you know, and, um, and so I'm trying to incorporate, incorporate that as much as possible, you know, but another thing that I do is, you know, I become so knowledgeable about autism by simply sidestepping anything that's too hard for me to comprehend and focusing on the stuff that you know that it's easier for me to comprehend and to go into a lot greater depth. You know, but in school you can't do that. Okay, in school if you're having a hard time understanding something, you can't just simply push it aside and focus on something that's easier to understand. You have to find a way to understand that material. And so, um, and so I'm still figuring things out, and I'm actually. Um, Next month, I'm actually going to do a, a presentation where I'm planning on, um, you know, talking about, you know, um, what I've figured out, you know, through my, um, what'll be by that time, two and a half months of schooling or three months. Um, started mid-January, so it'd be mid-March, so um, two months, something like that. Anyways. Um, Anyways, yeah, I, I don't want to do the math right now. But anyways, um, but yeah, I started on January 20th, and so, um, you know, and so anyways, um, so, so um, you know, because it, it's, it's definitely a work in progress, and there's definitely a lot of things that I've learned, you know, that would, that, um, that would definitely not only benefit autistics, but students in general as far as making informed decisions, you know, um, about, know what school to go to in the first place you know um, you know the pros and cons of different types of school uh, systems you know the public um, well the, the, the um, yeah yeah I guess you know the public college um, that's not the proper term but anyways versus the private college which is what I'm going to and and I think it's a really important subject matter and then also talking about the specific strategies that I've used that, that I've been using you know and how they've been panning out, but anyways, um, so, so anyway, so yes, I just started that in January, and so, um, so, and then, then Philip, um, you were talking to me earlier about so how you were volunteering over at this um, organization, um, you know, raising special kids. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about what you were doing? Yeah, what what the group, what the organization is about, and what you were doing. Um, Raising Special Kid is a nonprofit organization who um, basically uh, it's an informational uh, organization that helps a family with children with a variety of 
learning and disabled disabilities. Mm -hmm. And basically what their job is, is to help uh, families get the uh, information or um, the help that they need for their kids at school or mm -hmm. medical uh, reasons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so what exactly did you do for them? I was a uh, volunteer for the uh, Racing Special Kids. Basically, I did uh, filing, alphabetizing, I put packets together, I also did uh, shredding, and um, basically anything else that they mm -hmm. need help with. So, la largely clerical work is what, yes. that, what, what that would be referred to as clerical work. Okay, so, and, and you enjoyed doing it, and yeah. um, so anyways, and um, so, um, you know, it, but um, another thing that you and I were talking about, and we've actually talked about this on a couple occasions, and you gave me permission to bring this up, is is no is you at the um, at, at the East Valley meeting. It's a much larger group, like two dozen people, and um, and and would you like and, and and tell me in your own words how, how you feel about uh, about your role at that meeting. My role. Well, uh, how do you feel you fit in at that meeting? Uh, basically, I, uh, when I'm at the meeting, I, I guess I'm, you could say, I'm the listener of the group. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really say much at the group, but I do feel a sense of uh, acceptance there. Mm -hmm. I, there are people there who are sort of going through the same thing that I'm going through. Or mm -hmm. They have problems just like I have problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't really say much at the group, but I replace that with listening. I, mm -hmm. I guess you could say I'm a good listener when it comes mm -hmm. to stuff like that. Now, I do have a few friends there. I talk with uh, John and Ken and David. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I also talk to the new people there when mm -hmm. I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, one of the observations that, that I've made about you is yes, you are quiet during the group. You know, in, in larger settings, you basically fade into the background. And I do the same thing at at a major social event. You know, like you know, yeah, you know, um, you know, uh, a church dinner. You know, and you no, know, there's two dozen people there, and and they're all chit chatting away, and and I'm and I'm you no know, surrounded by, by people yet. All by myself because you know that's you know that's just uh, who I am you know you know because you know I, I have no function there you know if, if I you know when I'm in a, a setting where I, where I can find a function such as in the autism support group you know with me having learned all that I've learned over the years you know I can find a function for me but if I don't have a function you know such as a pure social event you know like a dinner or a dance or something like that, you know, yeah, I do melt into the background. But one thing I do notice is that when the meeting is over, you know, the one-on-one -on -one situations, you know, that, that's, you know, that's what you're describing is, you know, how, you know, you'll go, you know, to, you know, different individuals, in, you know, in the group and just starting being sociable. And another thing that, that I notice is that, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not going to be mentioning any names, but but you know, I've seen you, you know, um, you know, play peacemaker. You know, when people have gotten their feelings hurt, you know, there's, you know, you know, strife or or, or somebody's upset. You know, you know, um, you you've always you know you know just gone and and just you know, just you know, gone to that person, including me on a couple of occasions, and um, and just you know just. Being an all-around nice guy, you know, um, and, and and showing genuine concern uh, about them, and and so you know, yeah, you know, Sue and Tara, they're the brains of the outfit. I'm uh, I'm getting to where I'm the brains. You know, I, I contribute a lot of brains, but you know, the 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 biggest thing that you contribute, in, in my view, is that you're the glue. You know, you're the likable person that that. Nobody has a problem with. Some people have a problem with me. I do have a strong personality, and I and I do stand up for myself from time to time, and and so that does sometimes lead 
leads to me biting heads with people, and and I know that that you don't you know you don't like it you know when there is strife you know, and I understand that, and I and so uh, and I try to you know you know to you know to keep it down, but you know but but the one thing that you are you're the peacemaker, you know and if somebody you know gets their feelings hurt or or is involved in some kind of strife, you're there to try to. So, you know, soothe hurt feelings and to try to to keep keep us from losing people over this stuff and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you know they got you know it's their choice whether or not they respond you know um, you cannot make somebody respond but you certainly put forth the effort and and that's you know the the you know that that's the number one thing that I would you know definitely say about you is you know, no, you're not up front, but but you're but you do the stuff behind the scenes. You know, just like you know you said with raising special kids. You know, you're doing all the behind the scenes stuff that makes it easier for the professionals. You know, to work with the children and the parents. You know, and so um, so I guarantee if we went over there and and talked to them uh, about uh, about you and and you you had mentioned earlier that that you haven't been able to volunteer for a while because of transportation problems. I guarantee you if we went over there, they would tell you know tell tell us straight up that you know how much they miss you, you know because you know you do 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 a lot you know and so yeah, and just willingness to do the behind the scenes stuff. So anyway, so um, but um, anyway, so. We both got involved with, with this East Valley group, and um, and what what's the number one thing that it's or, or the most important things that you personally are getting out of that group? Uh, one thing I'm getting out of it is uh, when I well when I first uh, moved out here, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about Asperger's syndrome or autism. Mm -hmm. or, pervasive developmental delay with the autistic features, which is my diagnosis. And mm -hmm. As soon as I uh, heard about the group, mm -hmm. I was probably like you, like when I first heard the word Asperger, I was probably saying, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah. And how can I have Asperger? What, did, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. And so when I went to that group the first time, it's like, something clicked inside me and I was like, okay, and it was like past memories were coming up of certain things that I did in the past because of my uh, Asperger's syndrome and uh, meeting similar people in the, with the same uh, diagnos diagnostic and it was like, for the first time, I was uh, among people who were sort of like myself. Mm -hmm. And what I got out of the group was uh, probably the sociali socialization. Mm -hmm. I was um, able to talk with uh, some other people about uh, problems that I was having and what they were going through, and just all around social socialization. Mm -hmm. Something that it, before I was having a, a little problem with uh, neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, I made quite a few friends there. I, uh, even though I don't really talk much, but they can probably tell you that I'm a good listener. Mm -hmm. Like, well, most other people will probably be kind of bored or say, uh, thank you, but I'm going to go over here to this person. Mm -hmm. i probably one of the few people who stay and listens to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, anything else? Uh, well, I've also learned that some of them... A lot of the people there can are extremely intelligent and mm -hmm. they do mean well and they seem to know uh, what they want in the world. Mm -hmm. The fact that I too am quite intelligent, although 
I don't really see it myself. Find anything at all? I'm not sure if anyone else at the group sees it themselves. Or if they do, I really don't know because I'm not in their shoes, so. Yeah. Well, as far as you, it's hard for anybody really to know how intelligent you are because once again, you know, you don't talk a lot, so, you know, um, you know where somebody like me, you know, yeah, you can pretty much engage my intelligence level because I, I talk, Sue, Tara, you know, and a lot of other members, you know, you can definitely engage, you know, but, you know, a lot of the times, you know, you know, what we're, you know, the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, okay, you know, talking about, you know, typical versus atypical, okay, the typical nine out of ten people, you know, um, you know, you know, think within a certain range of ways, act in a certain range, range of ways, develop in a certain range of ways, then there's this tenth person, okay? What are you going to do with this tenth person? This tenth person might be disabled, this person might be a prodigy, okay? This person might, might be both. In the case of autistics, you know, we're, we're, we're extremely disabled in certain areas, but we'll be a prodigy in other areas. And the areas that we tend to struggle with are you know, in, in my, you know, my observation is, you know, the areas that we struggle with are the areas that the neurotypicals take for granted, you know, and, 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 and are the most routine things that, you know, that's, you know, that, that people are expected to, you know, to, are expected to be able to do where, where our, where our strengths, you know, you know, that they're not something that's going to show up you know, every day at work, at school, and stuff like that. But, but if we, you know, you know, but if, if we, you know, take the, our free time that we have, you know, when we're not doing, you know, the required stuff, school, work, so on and so forth, you know, our, our own personal time and, and focus on these different strengths, okay, that is when we'll find out what our genius is. And, and, my, and based on my observations of being in the group since, you know, September of 2009, this concept is completely foreign to the majority of the, of the high-functioning autists. Now, keep in mind, we go to a high-functioning autism group, so we're not even talking about, oh, what about the lower-functioning autistics? You know, even the higher-functioning autistics, you know, with the higher IQs, are so focused on the areas that they struggle that that they cannot they, they, they cannot comprehend the idea that they have unique strengths in certain areas and so you know that so what you're expressing isn't isn't unique I would you know say that that the majority uh, of the group believes the same thing of, about themselves you know because we're so focused on how how we can't do the you know the things that that's that everybody, that all the neurotypicals thinks is easy and that anybody should be able to do, that it's that we completely, you know, ignore you know, our strengths and, um, and, and, and that is just so self-destructive, you know, and so um, I would definitely, you know, you know, love to take up the challenge of finding your strengths because, you know, you know, like, you know, one of the things that I earlier mentioned, you know, is you just being a friend, you know, when somebody gets their feelings hurt, you know, just being that peacemaker, you know, when somebody gets their feelings hurt. Um, I'll deal with that later. Um, yeah, is, you know, when, when somebody gets their feelings hurt, you know, um, you just have, you know, that that's ability to disarm somebody you know, assuming that they want to be disarmed, of course, you know, and, um, and, and so, um, so, you know, you definitely have social skills. You have quality social skills. You may not have quantity social skills where you're able to make a hundred friends this year, but the friends that you, that you do have, I'll have to edit that out of the video, but uh, anyway, so, um, but, um, so, so, you know, is finding, you know, what your strength is, you know, because, you know, uh, I'm sure that, that you have them, you know, if, if nothing else, like I said, the ability to be a quality friend, you know, to, to people, you know, you may not have the ability to make a hundred friends, but you have the ability to be a good friend to whoever gives you that chance. And so, um, 
And, and that completely goes against what we're taught about autistics, how we're just so socially challenged that, you know, that that's, you know, we need to have, you know, the neurotypicals come in and teach us how to be sociable. And, you know, like I said, you know, in, in terms of, of quantity, no, you're, you're as bad as I am. In terms of quality, you're better than most neurotypicals that I know. As far as being a quality friend, you know, you're better than most neurotypicals that I know. You know, so, you know, that's, you know, that, that's another thing, you know, to consider when assessing an autistic's, um, you know, you know, you know uh, abilities, you know, you know, social skill abilities. It isn't just, can you make a hundred friends? The question is, how are you to the friends that you do have? You know, and so, um, so, you know, that's definitely one of your strengths. So, anyways, um, so what about your future um, plans? You know, what, what would you like to, to be doing in five years? Have you ever thought about that? You know, what you might like to be doing five years from now, a goal that you might want to achieve in the next five years? Well, yeah, I, well, one thing I would like to have uh, my own uh, apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, minimal supervise, supervising. Mm -hmm. I would love also like maybe to have my own car so I can uh, drive on my own. Okay. Even though I have a fear of driving. Okay, that's um, that that's something that that's that's you know um, you know can you know be overcome at, in time you know. Um, you know, uh, you know, because yeah, I, I still remember you know the first time I I pushed the accelerator, you know, uh, on you know on on the um, on the Ram Charger, the old um, oh what year was that? I think it was a '79 Dodge Ram Charger, you know, and um, yeah, and just feeling that exhilaration, you know, as you know, hearing the engine rev up, you know, and so yeah, you know, that there's there's a number of things, but anyway, so. Um, so, um, so what what have you been doing to work towards those goals? Well, I've been trying to find an apartment in Chandler, mm -hmm. but the prices are bloody expensive. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to find something that's under six hundred dollars, but yeah, it seems the only one that's under that is further away in uh, either Mesa or in uh, Phoenix. Yeah. Um, tell you what, you and I can talk about that off camera, you know, because I, I've got a few ideas that might work for you personally, um, you know, so, um, so, yeah, we can talk about that off camera. Well, not just any apartment, but yeah. an apartment where they understand that I do have this mm -hmm. Asperger syndrome and right. I have a certain needs and... Mm -hmm. And it has to be like in a neighborhood that's uh, not too uh, not too dangerous, but mm -hmm. I don't want something that's like far away, like away from society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I do want uh, peace and quiet, but I don't want dead. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, okay. Well, we can definitely, you know. Uh, you know, because I, I, I've already got some, some ideas, you know, as far as, um, you know, organizing something like that, you know, getting a bunch of autistics to to basically do what, what the refugees have, have been doing for years. You know, um, that's one of my volunteer projects, working with refugees. I've been doing that since 99. And, and basically, one refugee, you know, moves into an apartment and they talk all, all their countrymen into moving into that same apartment complex in order, you know, to, you know, to mutually support each other. And, and, you know, I think, you know, that can work for autistics as well, as far as, you know, um, you know, all moving into, you know, together to, you know, to um, an apartment complex. And so, you know, you would have the neighbors who understand, you know, who you are and, and your unique challenges. And so, um, and so, yeah, we can talk about that off camera. And as far as you, um, you know, eventually getting car. Have you been? Um, have you got your learner's permit yet for your driver's license? Have you, you know, studied that material yet? Yeah, a while ago, but unfortunately, I 
failed it twice. So. Oh, oh okay. So um, the, you, you, the, the written exam or the on road? The written exam. The written exam. Okay. So, um, so we have, we'll, so you know, maybe you and I can get together. You know, to, um, you know, get me a, you know, the latest copy of, or actually, I'd probably download it offline of the driver's license manual and some. And you and I can see if we can you know, go over it together and some, and you know, um, see if we can you know, pass it this time around. So. Well, it's more of the road test that I'm worried about because I get extremely nervous when I'm yeah. in the car. And yeah. I'm out there with all those other cars. Well, well, yeah. Well, the thing is, you don't start off there. Okay, is you get your learner's permit, and then then you start start off in just some parking lot. Okay, where where, where you just get comfortable, you know, driving the car, you know, um, no other cars for you to run into, just you all by yourself, and, and, and your, your trainer, you know, the, you know, your teacher, I, I've done this before, and you'll, you know, probably be at night, because that's when the parking lots are all empty, and, um, and then eventually, you know, you'll work your, your way up, you know, to, you know, um, you know, to, you know, driving daytime, start driving on less traveled uh, roads, side roads, eventually driving on the street, and then finally driving on the freeway. Okay, and um, you no, know, the freeway is definitely the last, you know, the, the last step in your your learning curve, your your learning process. Because, uh, yeah, you know, that that's something that, you know, you have, you definitely need to know what you're doing before you get on the freeway for the first time. Yeah, anybody that's uh, ever learned to drive will ver verify that. Yeah, is so um, so that that's what what you do is is you. You take it step by step. You know, you don't jump right on the freeway. You take it step by step, and gradually, you know, you know, um, increase your level of difficulty as time goes on. So, anyways, um, so you know, we can you know definitely work on that. You know, as far as my own personal goals, um, you know, is you know working on being autistic, you know, self advocate, you know, and and um, and presenting this material to other people, getting off SSI. You know, regaining my financial independence. That's the reason why I'm going back to school, is to regain my financial independence. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I've I've got a number of um, of goals as well. So, um, anyways, so as far as you know, um, your your current situation, you know, you know what um, your current needs. Uh, is there anything in particular, you know, that you know that it's um, you know, uh, any needs that you feel that you have right now, you know, that that's that you might might like being, you know, like to have addressed, you know, any concerns? Um, uh, you mean like the group or? Just in, in your personal life, you know, to improve your own quality of life, to make life better for you. Okay, so, anyways, um, so, um, yeah, so, you know, um, and, and for me, you know, like I said, you know, I'm basically, you know, working on getting these groups started and things like that, so, anyways, um, so, yeah, um, so, so anything else that you might like, you know, like to just throw out there at, you know, as a discussion topic, you know, a, you know, a really important, you know, thing that, that you think that the autism and autistic community should, you know, you know, should be talking more about? Is there anything particular that you think is most important for, for people to understand about autistics? Uh, well, first of all, it seems like Nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, because of all the shootings that's been <clears throat> going on, it seems uh, people nowadays are getting into the are getting it, it into their heads that whether when they hear the word autism or Asperger, mm -hmm. yeah, the first thing that comes into their mind is ooh massacre shoot shooter, yeah, or future massacre shooter. 
Yeah, and you're, you're not the only autistic that's, that's really worried about that. And, and parents as well, you know, because I've been on Facebook, you know, particularly after the, um, the massacre at Sandy Hook, you know, and, you know, these parents were, were fearful for retaliation against their own children because of their diagnosis. And, um, and so, yeah, that's definitely a, you know, a, a major concern. And, and my response, you know, is, you know, is what, what I talk about having a holistic understanding of autistics, not just simply, oh, we're wired differently, here's an itemized list of all of our problems, but actually understanding that we are first and foremost human beings and understanding how we function. And, um, you know, and, and, and when you understand that, you would realize that the percentage of, of violence, the, the, the amount of violence, okay, yeah, the percentage of autistics who are violent is significantly less than that of neurotypicals. I'm convinced that that's, that if you know that that if you look at 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 all the people that are committing violence, you know, um, you know that you know that the percentage that are autistics is significantly below the percentage of autistics in society. You know, I really do believe that. For you know, and again. You know that this is something that that I you know go through in my book. You know, talking about how autistics respond to, you know, stress and various stimuli, and um, of course they also have have free choice. Some, you know, just, just like neurotypicals. You know, they've had bad experiences that you know they've been from abusive backgrounds. You know, autistics are, you know, I, I contend are the most uh, bullied segment of society. More bullied than the gays, than than Muslims ethnic minorities, you know, and, and even the ones from the previous group that were bullied, you know, I, I would hazard a guess that, that a, that a, um, that a, that, that's, that, uh, that a very significant percentage of them are also autistic and it's, and it might actually have more to do with, with their, that, with how people respond to their autism than their, their race, ethnicity, so on and so forth. But, you know, that's, you know that that's something that that's just something I suspect I can't you know completely prove. But but in any case, you know, people you know, have have a choice. You know, you know, um, you know, some people choose to do what do unto others as others did unto them. You know, and become violent themselves. Others will go and volunteer to work for a domestic violence shelter. Others will become a police officer in order to protect people from. No violence. So, so you know, so all this, you know, you know, you know, background aside, you know, bottom line is, you know, people do have choices. Okay, and and being an autistic is not automatically going to make me violent. Just as being neurotypical doesn't automatically make you violent. You know, um, there are choices involved. You know, um, you know, and um, and so, you know, so you know, um, in some. And yeah, you know, it's it's a much lengthier subject, and it's one that's you know that the purpose of this particular group, where we're going through my book, you know, yeah, is is giving that holistic understanding of autism, so where um, you know to what where where you understand you know why autistics you know are going to respond to certain situations, you know why they're prone to, to responding to certain situations, you know the way they do, but nevertheless, you know, like I said, it still doesn't. Um, negate free will. This does not negate the fact that autistics can learn stress management just like anybody else. Okay, and um, and autistics can learn conflict resolution skills just like everybody else. And and I think you're a prime example. Like I said, you are the peacemaker in our group. You know, when somebody gets their feelings hurt, you know, you you, you know you take it upon yourself to go and to. And, you know, to just be the, the greatest friend, and, um, and, and so, you know, so, yeah, we can learn conflict resolution skills, we can learn to be mediators, you know, just like you do, you know, when people get their feelings hurt in our group, you know, and so, um, but yeah, that, that is really an important issue, you know, is, um, you know, um, you know uh, a major issue for me is what I refer to as the cure or bust mentality. Okay, and this is a major debate, you know, in the autism community. A lot of autistic self-advocates, 
believe that it's, you know, that the concept of a cure, you know, um, you know, they take it personal that, that it's, that, that it's inherently shows that we're inherently defective and they take strong exception to it. And so they're opposed to any cure whatsoever. Okay, whereas, you know, we're, we're, you know, you know, we have parents, especially of lower functioning autistic children, who, who believe that, that no cure equals no hope. If, if my child does not get cured, then, then he or she is going to be condemned to a life of suffering. And there, and there are parents that are, that are like that, you know, and, and, and I talked about, okay, okay, well, okay, so you want, once, you want your child to be cured, fine, okay, you know, but what are you going to do today? You know, you know, maybe five to ten years from now, you know, this scientific research on fragile X, maybe that'll lead to a cure five to ten years from now. What about five to ten minutes from now? What's your child going to do then? You know, and and there are so some people that are just so you know focused on on their cure bus strategy, they just simply will not even discuss that. You know, discuss. You know, well, can we do something? You know, to, to improve your child's quality of life right now by teaching them, you know, some kind of skill set to manage their own stress, to manage conflicts. And, and they are just so convinced that, that, that their child cannot be saved unless they get cured that they will not listen to it. And so, you know, so basically I'm of the position where everybody ha has, has a right to decide if they want to be cured. Okay, I know a couple of autistics. They're just as high functioning as us. They're, you know, the, their IQs are just as high as us. You know that they show brilliance in various ways, but they want to be cured, and that's their right. You know, if a cure came out tomorrow, you know, and um, and and um, you know, and, and and that and they signed up to to undergo the treatment, I would be willing to drive them there. To, to be with them through the entire procedure, and if and if the procedure you know works and and they throw a celebration party, I hope I get invited. But the thing is, I don't know why I need to be cured of my 140 IQ and idemic memory, which absolutely astonishes people. And um, you know, and so and, and again, this gets to a uh, into the holistic, you know, understanding of autistics, not just simply focusing on, okay, my executive functioning stinks, okay, you know, and, um, you know, that has to do with organizational skills, problem solving, so on and so forth, hey, it stinks, period, okay, so you have a blind person, okay, you know, how does a, a person compensate for, for losing their sight? By having, uh, you know, um, enhanced hearing, smell, and other senses. Okay, so what is the countermeasure, you know, that um, for for the body, you know, if you have horrible executive functioning? Well, I believe that there is enough body of evidence pointing to our, our you know, memorization that you know, you know that that I am convinced that, that that's what it is. You no, know, but the thing is, you know, when we demonstrate you know, our superior memory, people treat it like it's some circus freak show attribute of ours and completely dismiss it as an actual asset, you know, and absolutely refuse to acknowledge that it is a countermeasure for, for our poor executive functioning. Okay, you know, uh, a neurotypical is going to use their executive functioning to figure out how to invent the wheel, okay? As an autistic with horrible executive functioning, I'm never going to figure it out on my own. However, I've observed 10 people try to invent the wheel Okay, and I can give a detailed analysis of, of the different methods that, that, that these 10 people used, what worked, what didn't work, and, and, and contribute, you know, you know, by, you know um, in this manner, you know, as a member uh, of the group, okay? And, and, I, and it's obvious to me that this is unique to autistics because when I, uh, on many occasions, when I try to, to, to you know, you know, to utilize, you know, um, um, you know, troubleshooting in this manner, people are, accuse me of being negative. Oh, you're being negative. You know, it's like, no, I'm troubleshooting. You know, it's, troubleshooting is just second nature to me. 
Don't ask me to invent the wheel, but if you want me to troubleshoot the wheel that you are inventing, that's my job. My job is to troubleshoot the wheel that you're inventing. I can't invent the wheel, but I can troubleshoot the wheel that you're inventing. And, and so, you know, you know, like I said, you know, um, that this one talking about, you know, when, um, you know, talking about taking a holistic approach to understanding autism. You know, I'm not, you know, trying to spin a negative into a positive, nor am I spinning a positive into a negative, which is what I feel that's, you know, that it's, um, you know, that, that these autism professionals do is, is, you know, that they spend our, our greatest assets in a negative. Oh, we talk too much, you know, we, we just go on and on in, in excessive detail about about all this stuff and we're not interested in all that excessive detail well okay so you want a, an, an abridged understanding of the situation where we want an unabridged understanding who's going to be more knowledgeable about the situation the person with the abridged understanding and absolutely gets upset when somebody tries to present an unabridged understanding or the person who just by nature um, embraces the unabridged understanding, who just wants to learn everything, who's more knowledgeable about that subject? And, and um, you know, to me it seems pretty obvious that it's going to be the autistic that is more intelligent because we want to be. We want to, you know, we are compelled to, have, uh, to pursue the unabridged understanding, whereas the neurotypicals get all upset at us because we don't want that much detail. We want the abridged version, you know, and, 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 and turn it into as a negative about us. And, and you know, that's what I'm talking about, them spinning a, a, you know, what is inherently a positive into a negative, you know, and I think that's unfair to us, you know, that we demonstrate that we have, you know, some unique abilities and they spin those unique abilities into negatives and, and, um, and then they turn around and, and accuse us of being closed-minded. Well, it seems, and we were just talking, actually we talk about that from time to time, you know, in the Tempe meeting, you know, um, at Sue and Tara's group is, oh, well, if, you know, if they're so open-minded, you know, which they're not, you know, if we're the ones that are so closed-minded, you know, why, why can't they open up their minds to the possibility of this, this, and this, you know, and, um, why can't they open up to, to uh, their minds to the possibility that we might know some things that they don't, you know? And um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, issues that need to be, be discussed. And that's one that the, my goals is to get people, autistics and neurotypicals to come together, you know, um, you know, to discuss these things. But the problem is there's a wall of segregation, you know, that, that keeps autistics, parents, and professionals from having direct dialogue with each other, you know, and so, you know, so, um, so, you know, basically all the misunderstandings are going to continue to be perpetuated from generation to generation uh, until somebody figures out that the only way that these misunderstandings can be solved is by us sitting down together and talking about them. And that is something that our society does not do. It does not sit down you know, oh, it, that is not how they, they, they deal with us autistics. Basically, the professionals, you know, that they dictate, you know, who we are, you know, how we will be defined, and how we will be dealt with. And, and you know, that they appoint themselves as our representatives without our consultation or consent. And, and, um, and you know, even though, you know, I agree with 80 to 90 percent of of what they talk about the other 10 to 20 percent yeah we have serious issues with them but they won't talk to us they don't have to because they got the fancy piece of paper that says that they're omnipotent see phd that means omnipotent that means that you cannot tell me anything i know it all okay and it's and it and it it would be like you know ha having a a discussion about about um about our foreign policy in the Middle East and forbid anybody who's actually been born and raised in the Middle East to participate in the dialogue. Because what do they know? You know, they're biased. You know, that's, you know, that, that's, you know, um, you know that, that's the, the view that, that we're treated at is that our viewpoint is tainted by being autistic. Well, that's like saying somebody who's born and raised in the Middle East 
has a tainted view about what's happening in the Middle East. You know, it's it's really that absurd, and yet that's basically, you know, how, how we're we're treated when we're trying to, you know, to contribute to the subject. You know, the fact that we have autism disqualifies us from discussing autism. You know, and it's ludicrous. And so, anyways, um, so so yeah, that's that, that's that's my mini rant for today. You know, so anyways. Um, so, is there anything else you like might like to share, Philip?